on July 8, 2022, in the bustling city of Nara, Japan, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was shot while delivering a speech at the Nara Saidaiji station. Despite rescue efforts, he was pronounced dead at the age of 67. The assassination of a national figure in broad daylight is truly shocking and horrific. Both domestically and internationally, people expressed their condolences and shock following the incident. Abe's assassination brings to mind several other shocking assassinations of prime ministers in Japan's modern history and the series of chain reactions they triggered. Since the establishment of the position in 1885, Japan has had a total of 64 prime ministers, including Shinzo Abe. Of these, including Abe, seven have been assassinated, which is nearly one-ninth. The first to be assassinated was the first prime minister, Hirobumi Ito. Ito was not a warmonger. He maintained an ambiguous and hesitant attitude toward both the First Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, but ultimately he could not overcome the war supporters led by his old classmate Yamagata Aritomo. In 1905, after consecutive victories over the Qing Dynasty and Tsarist Russia, Japan easily brought the Korean Peninsula under its full control and established the Korean Residency General to oversee and monitor all affairs in Korea. Coincidentally, the first resident general was Hirobumi Ito. However, many high-ranking officials in Japan viewed this position as unnecessary, as their true goal was to fully annex Korea and turn the peninsula into a Japanese prefecture. Hirobumi Ito opposed this. Firstly, he believed that if Japan acted decisively, it would likely lead to international opposition, which would ultimately be detrimental. Secondly, at that time, Ito was not doing particularly well in Japanese domestic politics and saw an opportunity to create a new political landscape in Korea. If the radical faction simply incorporated Korea into Japan, it would not serve his interests. As a result, it was the more radical old classmate Yamagata Aritomo, who led a group of high-ranking officials in demanding the swift implementation of the annexation policy. The two sides struggled for four or five years without reaching a conclusion. The annexation of Korea was thus put on hold. During these years, although Korea was not formally annexed due to Hirobumi Ito's opposition, the forced policies of the annexation faction significantly stripped the Korean people of their rights and dignity it became only a matter of time before Korea would become a Japanese prefecture. Consequently, Korean patriots decided to resort to assassinating Japanese officials to save their homeland. But who should be the target? Logically, it should have been Yamagata Aritomo, right? However, the Koreans chose Hirobumi Ito. On October 26, 1909, Korean nationalist An jung geun saw Ito slowly emerge at the Harbin station in China. He pulled out a pistol and fired several shots into the crowd, causing Hirobumi Ito to fall to the ground. Perhaps due to a moment of lucidity before his death, Hirobumi Ito was remarkably clear-headed. His first words were, Who did it? By this time, the Korean assassin An jung geun had already been pinned to the ground and his Korean identity was immediately recognized. Upon hearing this, Hirobumi Ito became agitated. A Korean shot me? Is he stupid? Then he called over his grandson, Ito Manshuo, and asked, Who else was shot? The reply was, Mori Kainen. Hirobumi Ito's eyes filled with sadness. Mori got shot too. These were his last words before he died. Mori Kanin was a pure poet who had come to visit Ito for some leisure and to gather some inspiration, only to catch a bullet. The following year, Japan formally annexed Korea, adding another justification, Hirobumi Ito's fate for opposing annexation. The assassination of Hirobumi Ito set a precedent. Not only was he the first prime minister to be assassinated, but it also led people within Japan to realize that assassination could be quite effective. The annexation faction had argued with Ito for a long time without success. If someone just assassinated him, the problem would be solved. 
although this time it was a coincidence that a Korean carried out the assassination. Next time, they could do it themselves. Twelve years later, the assassination of a prime minister happened again. On November 4, 1921, then Prime Minister Takashi Hara was assassinated at Tokyo Station at the age of 65. This time, the assassin was Nakaoka Konichi, an employee at Otsuka Station. The two places are actually quite close. It takes about 20 minutes on the Yamanote line, roughly 11 stations away. He probably didn't even buy a ticket. According to Nakaoka Konichi's confession, his motive was Hara's opposition to the Universal Suffrage Act proposed by the opposition party. Simply put, at that time, voting in Japan required payment, and someone suggested that everyone should have the right to vote, allowing ordinary people to elect representatives. Hara opposed this, so he was eliminated for the people. This is indeed a pretext so grandiose that it is outrageous. In fact, Takashi Hara did not oppose the Universal Suffrage Act. However, Nakaoka Konichi might not have known this. The key point is that while Nakaoka was in prison, he occasionally received visits and assistance from members of the Genyosha, a well-known Japanese right-wing group. In 1934, he was released from prison. Yes, you read that correctly. He served only 13 years for assassinating a prime minister. He received significant support from Gen Yosha's leader, Toyama Mitsuru, and was subsequently sent to serve in the military in northeastern China. Gen Yosha was a well-known right-wing organization in Japan, and Toyama Mitsuru was a prominent militarist. The real reason behind Hara's assassination was that Japan, as a victorious nation after World War I, accepted the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited naval armaments. This treaty displeased many who were constantly contemplating global expansion, including Nakaoka Konichi. According to his superior, Igoro Hashimoto, Nakaoka repeatedly declared in various settings that Hara had lost the samurai spirit and needed to be eliminated. As a result, even after Takashi Hara's death, Japan still joined the Washington Naval Treaty. However, domestic populism began to rise, which was vividly demonstrated during the great Kanto earthquake of 1923. The earthquake damaged the electrical grid, plunging Tokyo into complete darkness that night. Opportunists took advantage of the chaos, which was not unusual. However, rumors began to spread, claiming that the looters were all Korean immigrants and that people needed to protect their women, children, and property. This led to a massacre initiated by Japanese civilians against Koreans living in Japan. At the same time, the Japanese public began to increasingly view the Western powers as enemies, believing that the treaties were intentionally designed to limit Japan's military development and such forces deserved to be eliminated. However, Japan's political leaders retained their sanity and recognized that Japan was not yet strong enough to directly confront the Western powers. After much deliberation in 1930, Prime Minister Osachi Hamaguchi and his cabinet unanimously decided to join the London Naval Disarmament Conference. Simply put, this meant reducing naval armaments and decreasing the total tonnage of ships. On the one hand, this was to avoid worsening relations with the UK and the US, but more importantly, it was because Japan was running out of money, as it was the second year after the Great Depression of 1929. However, this decision displeased the Japanese public, and the naval sector, which had a vested interest, was also unhappy. Yet, these groups clearly could not directly interfere with the Prime Minister's decision unless they resorted to extreme measures. On November 14, 1930, Genyosha member Sagoya Domeo shot Prime Minister Osachi Hamaguchi at Tokyo Station. Hamaguchi was severely wounded and sent to the hospital, but after struggling for nine months, he succumbed to his injuries in August of the following year. The assassin was imprisoned for nine years. Within ten years, two prime ministers had been consecutively assassinated, leading many Japanese people, especially those with guns, to realize that they could directly eliminate any high-ranking official they disagreed with. On September 18, 1931, 
Japan invaded northeastern China in what is historically known as the Mukden Incident. This was actually an unauthorized action by the military, and after the incident, Japanese politicians were not keen on further expanding the conflict. The general consensus in Japan was to settle things while they were ahead. However, the military firmly believed in one principle. Whoever blocks our financial path, we will eliminate. On May 15, 1932, a group of naval officers dissatisfied with the London Naval Disarmament Treaty, discontented with the cabinet, unhappy with the ceasefire in the Shanghai incident, and frustrated with the financial crisis, stormed into the Prime Minister's residence fully armed and assassinated then Prime Minister Tsuyoshi Inukai on the spot. There were many reasons, but the most important one was interfering with the Emperor's Supreme Command Authority. In simpler terms, the officers believed that the Emperor should stand with them and lead them in pursuing global expansion policies, but Inukai did not. As a politician inclined towards peace, Inukai was deemed to deserve death. After the May 15th incident, Japan began to move rapidly towards a military government. They soon encountered a major problem. They had no money. For the military to increase its budget, it needed approval from the Minister of Finance, who was then Takahashi Korokiyo. Takahashi repeatedly rejected the military's requests. Takahashi Korokiyo had a rather legendary life. In his youth, he signed an indenture contract due to his lack of English proficiency and was sold to the United States. During his time there, he learned English, and upon returning to Japan, he studied economics and became an economist. He even served as the vice president of the Bank of Japan. During the Great Depression of 1929, Takahashi Korakiyo helped Japan recover relatively quickly from the crisis. However, by 1934, the Army and Navy jointly demanded an additional 40 million yen in military funds from the Ministry of Finance on top of the existing budget. Takahashi Korakiyo firmly opposed this. The budget comes from the people and needs to be used where it is needed, not just continuously given to the military. In fact, if everything goes to the military, the entire economic system will quickly collapse and you won't get any more money. Considering the military's growing power at the time, Takahashi Korakiyo offered a compromise of 20 million yen to be split equally between the army and navy. This act cemented their hatred towards him. On February 26, 1936, the Kodoa faction of the army, under the pretext of the people suffering while the elites enjoy luxury and the need to purify the emperor's advisors, launched a coup. The essence of this event was the military's desire to gain promotions and wealth through war, intending to drag all of Japan into a global conflict. Whether the people were suffering or not was of no concern to them. In fact, the Japanese people did suffer greatly because of the war, without any imperial army coming to their rescue. At that time, Takahashi Korakiyo was the Minister of Finance, and he was not spared. That night, a squad of soldiers broke into his house, rushed upstairs, and shot Takahashi Korekio six times, killing him at the age of 83. Assassination is indeed a means of political struggle, but since its inception, it has never had a positive effect and often leads to the opposite outcome. An jung felt that his homeland was about to be annexed, so he killed Ito Hirobumi, which ended up accelerating the annexation of the Korean Peninsula. The assassination of Takashi Hara, whether orchestrated by the Genyosha or carried out by a lone disgruntled individual dissatisfied with his timid diplomacy, overall pushed Japan further into the abyss of radicalism. The deaths of Tsuyoshi Inukai and Korakiyo Takahashi were even more significant. Their assassinations were like a kick to Japan's back, propelling the country completely into the abyss. Of course, People at the time couldn't feel this, and even felt a thrill akin to riding a speeding vehicle as they descended. 
A simple summary reveals that almost all assassinated Japanese prime ministers were individuals striving to maintain a balance of power among various factions. However, trying to offend no one often meant offending everyone. Consequently, there were always one or two factions with radical ideas and extreme actions that resorted to hiring assassins to commit murder. The assassination of modern Japanese prime ministers has historically caused shifts in the East Asian situation. It is still uncertain what the aftermath of Shinzo Abe's assassination will be, but in any case, the assassination of an important politician in a time of peace undoubtedly sows seeds of uncertainty for the future.